It is an absolute joy to be here with you this blistering Sunday morning. <laughs> there is something about this Chicago cold. Uh, uh, it cuts to the bone. <laughs> and for an old Mississippi boy like myself, uh, even though I've lived in New Jersey for a number of years, I just can't quite get used to it. But I'm here. I'm cold, but I'm here. And I want to thank you sincerely for inviting me to celebrate with you this morning the life of the legacy of Dr. Earl Jones. Now, I should say, I said I was going to say it, but I'm going to say it again. And I should say a brief word about my dear brother, Dr. Fulton Ford. I wrote it down, so I'm going to listen up. We've known each other for some time. I think I was 15 or 16 years old when we first, first met in Morehouse. Back then, he carried himself with a calm intensity. And that disarming smile was just as powerful then as it is now. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Porter carries himself with such dignity and treats others with such care and love that he witnesses in his daily life the message of the church. Yes. And he carries forward the radical ministry of Absalom Jones. He saves lives with those magical hands of his. And he saves souls with that heart of his. Yes. So it's only fitting that the occasion of our reunion after these so many years would be only celebrated on this day. So I've written about the importance of black Christendom in the early 19th century. My aim then was to give an account of how black Christianity and the institution of the church afforded African Americans an institutional space to imagine themselves as a people, to think about the obligations that follow from such an imagining, and to provide a kind of elbow room, apart from the debilitating gaze of white racism, to breathe and to challenge structures of domination that cut short the life chances of black people. Now that's a fancy way of saying that black Christianity has been central to the political imagination of black America. That it has offered languages of protest and has provided institutional space for organizing and mobilizing to resist white supremacy in this country. Reverend Absalom Jones, as you know, stands as a central figure in this regard. Of course, we know him from that founding moment, that founding moment in black Christendom. St. George's Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, where while on their knees praying, Jones and Richard Allen were told to get up and go to the nigger fields. You see, white supremacy, and by that I mean something straightforward. The belief that white people are valued more than others. Colored, white supremacy colored the Christian gospel. Whiteness mattered. It, it mattered during service as congregations were segregated. It mattered when receiving the sacrament of the Eucharist as black folk had to wait until the last white person received the body of Christ. It mattered even unto death. And black people had to be buried in separate cemeteries. White Christianity declared that in the eyes of God, black people were somehow less than. But Absalom Jones, and a home alongside a host of other black abolitionists, refused to accept Christianity on such terms. They rejected white Christianity as a form of idolatry. The great theologian Howard Thurman would say that people like Jones dare to redeem the religion profaned in their midst. And in their hands, a distinctive Christian witness emerged, one that challenged directly the evil of white supremacy. Now, unlike others, Reverend Jones did not take the step to found a new black denomination. Join Richard Allen and others with the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or he didn't join those who would fall out of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion in New York. He didn't step out of the Episcopal Church. Instead, he decided to bear witness to a loving. Mm. He believed 
embodied in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. He was convinced that Christian discipleship required that we forgive white folks for the evil of slavery and that through our forgiveness we would give to the world. Yes. The power of God's enduring and transforming love. Now I can tell the story of the co pamphlet in 1793 in which he challenged efforts to scapegoat black Philadelphia for the epidemic of yellow people. I could, I, I, I could talk about the 1797 petition to the federal government to end slavery and revoke the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act, the first petition to join the prophetic fire of black Christians with the fire of the revolutionary era. I could, I could even mention his refusal to join with the American Colonization Society to encourage free blacks to live, to leave this country because he did not want to abandon those who were still in bondage. But, but all of that would be merely a history lesson. And Absalom Jones' witness is more than a history lesson. His life calls us to bear witness in our own times. To stand up against evil in the name of Jesus who was crucified on Yes. So I want to preach. Come on. I want to turn just for a moment. Well, this happened just last night, so I couldn't tell. But I'm going to give you Isaiah 61 in this summer. I want to turn for a moment to Luke 4, 16 through 21. There we read of Jesus returning to the synagogue at Nazareth. And it was Jesus' custom, not simply to worship in the synagogue, but to present his message. And he was given by the attendant of the temple, the scroll of Isaiah to read. And Jesus read, quote, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. Now after reading the scroll, Jesus gazed upon all who listened and said to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, you can imagine, as I can, what these folk thought of such a proclamation. Isn't that Joseph's son? <laughs> what is Mary's baby talking about? Lord, these children go off and come back talking all kinds of nonsense. <laughs> I can imagine that once the magnitude of Jesus' utterance settled in, many, if not all, became angry and dismissive. Yes. They did not believe him, nor truly hear him. <laughs> and in some ways, they couldn't believe or hear him because such a proclamation from this lonely Jew would upset the order of things. Yes. Now, I want to take up the implications of Jesus' claim that the scroll of Isaiah was fulfilled in his reading in their hour hearing. And I want to suggest to you that Jesus here defines the form and content of his ministry, a ministry exemplified in the life of Absalom Jones. Jesus makes clear what he's charged to do, why he's come to us in the first place. Too often many Christians forget that Jesus came to unsettle the seats of power and joy. Yes. Yes. To speak to those locked out of the then current social arrangements. Right. Jesus did not sacrifice his life so that the ugliness of the world could continue to define our living. He came to shake things up. Yeah. To reorder our social world. To proclaim that all of us are 
children of God and by His grace and love and through our witness of that grace and love in our daily actions, heavenly rewards are available to anyone. But to hear that message, to hear that message is to unsettle the order of things. That message did not sit well with the seats of power. How did you think you got up on the cross? Yeah. Huh? Y'all yeah. all right? Yeah. But what do we see today? Uh, we see the senseless death of young black men and women at the hands of people who are supposedly charged to protect them. Children putting their lives on the line and crying out, we can't breathe, or black lives matter, radically disrupting our daily comforts. Where is the radical voice of the church? Yeah. Yeah. We see a startling divide between the rich and the poor, and the very poor. The one percent and the top one-tenth of a percent continue to rob the nation blind, while more and more of our fellow Americans fall into the shadows. Where is the radical voice of the church? Recently, President Obama dared to caution humility among Christians. Dared to take him, and these close Christians dared to take him to task for urging humility when it comes to religious violence, as if blood has never been on the hands of Christians. I'm reminded of Howard Thurman again. He says, when asked how could he profess to be a Christian as a black man in America, was asked this question while in India. Howard Thurman responded, well, I want to make a distinction between being a follower of Christianity and a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. All right. He said, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was a radical in his time. But in our times, too many Christians are cozy. And comfortable with the status quo and the order of things. They're more interested in demonstrating how Christian they are than witnessing the message of Christ in a world with so much suffering. They're like peacocks, <laughs> all too interested in strutting their feathers. Peacocks can't fly. <laughs> Some of them were interested in getting close to the power. Then critiquing power. Oh, yeah. They're court prophets. Yeah. But what happens when our Savior's message is yoked to state power? Mm. What happens when the state can deploy Jesus to obscure and blind us to the realities of the world in need? Uh, just as Obama professed his Christian sensibilities at that national prayer breakfast. Blood is on his hands. As American drones have left the bodies of mangled babies beneath the rubble in Pakistan and around the world. Where is the radical voice of the church? Oh, Pastor Paul, you didn't know you were bringing me up in this church. <laughs> Inside 
South Africa. Just to give you a sense of the devastation. Now we know that ours is a religious nation. <laughs> At least 80% of Americans call themselves Christian. 72% expect the second coming of Christ. And at least 40% say they talk to God on a regular basis. So what happens when this native religiosity becomes the mobilizing stuff of the most powerful? My good friend Cornel West calls it Constantinian Christianity. Referencing the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine and his incorporation of Christianity within the empire. This move provided Christianity with legitimacy and respectability, but robbed it of the prophetic fervor and fire of Jesus. Constantinian Christians become obsessed with power. Constantinian Christians are corrupted by it and hide behind a false piety to keep us from seeing what is really being valued. Jesus' prophetic witness gets buried in dogma and encrusted in rigid formulations, litmus test to decide who is a real Christian and who is not. Constantinian Christians no longer hear the prophetic words of Christ, and America has a long history of this deafness to Jesus' words. Now I'm reminded of those darker souls. who by the mysteries of history were snatched from their native lands and brought to this country who heard it in a sermon from Absalom Jones. It comes out of that tradition, that blue-soaked tradition. I'm reminded of their initial embrace of Christianity, that the slaveholders knew that there was something unsettling about the gospel, and at the end, the hands of the oppressed, that this religion could generate a different kind of spirit. Isaiah 61 is coming in. <laughs> they understood that point so well that they were literally reluctant to allow missionaries to proselytize among the slaves. They were only convinced to allow them to do so when the argument was made that Christianity would make them better slaves. The extent to which this view was held as best sin, this is happening for children, when a candidate, black candidates for baptism, were required to assent to this. Listen to this quote. You declare in the presence of God and before this congregation that you do not ask for the holy baptism out of any desire to free yourself from the duty and obedience that you owe to your master, Robert Miller. But merely for the good of your soul and to partake of the graces and blessings to the members of the Church of Jesus Christ. For those committed to the evil of slavery, race and greed colored their religious commitments and we do not see, as a result of such obvious hypocrisy, the embrace of Christianity by slaves into the great revivals of the 1740s and 1780s. For during those revivals, there was an emphasis not simply on religious instruction, but rather on the inner experience of God's love and grace through conversion. God's presence was capillary. His spirit flowed through the bloodstream of the converted. And this conversion experience held tremendous implications for the life of the slave, just as it did for those who experienced the Holy Spirit of the Pentecost. Y'all all right? Yeah. The slave was made anew. She was transformed by the reordering presence of God. You see, the slaveholder misunderstood that religious instruction cut at least two ways. One could teach the slaves the prayers and doctrines and rites of Christianity, but if they were to be more than mere parents of the faith, they would have to understand the meaning of Christianity. But it's precisely in this that the slaveholder had little control. Mm -hmm. For the slaves brought their cultural past to the task yes, right. of translating and interpreting the doctrinal words and ritual gestures of Christianity. We put a little soul in it, a little funk in it. We brought us to it. <laughs> Therefore, the meaning which the missionary wished the slaves to receive, and the meanings which the slaves actually found or better made, were not the same. So much so, the slave.
save again, redeemed the religion profaned in its midst. Like Christianity is idolatry. Mm. Let me see. White right. Christianity is idolatry. Disagree with that, and we need to go to the guts. <laughs> Their embrace of Christianity reflected a fundamental transformation of the spirit. I'm coming home. You know, I'm coming. <laughs> they were no longer defined by the power of relationship of the master and the slave. They no longer saw themselves as simply extensions of the master's will. No. God's presence in their lives short circuited the power that defined the master slave religion. Yes. yes. They were now beholden to a master oh, yes. who was no respecter of person. Wow. The gave his son to die for all, bond or free, black or white, rich or poor, and by virtue of that relationship and the spirit which manifested their material existence was real. The power of Christianity for the slave and those who were tied to them rested in its perfect dimensions. And many Christians today, black and white, would do well to return to these early American Christians who, like those persons on Pentecost, were filled with a new life. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Because of the transforming power of the Spirit, folk need to be saved. You must be drunk. <laughs> not justify the order of things, if we order his personality and the world. Uh, but today we have Christians, Bishop, who would put the Pharisees to shame. Ah, <laughs> uh, they walk around like they're spiritual aristocrats. <laughs> Condemning folk to hell like they have a patent on God's grace and love. They want to protect feasts. But they say little about the babies that are suffering right here, right now. <laughs> These Christians, they want to define what constitutes genuine loving relationships. But they seemingly have no love in their hearts for those who are different than themselves. <laughs> they want to talk about values. But they socialize their children into unloving and undemocratic dispositions. What are you saying to your child when you say you can't embrace that brother or that sister because they're Muslim? What are you saying and what are you teaching to people when that's all that comes out of your mouth is hatred of difference and you want to condemn folk for not embracing your version of this? Teaching them hate in the name of Bible. Ah, oh, you got some of these Christians out here preaching, <laughs> preaching about the bounty that is the Lord in terms of material prosperity. A prosperity gospel orienting the same to riches and material goods instead of urging them to criticize greed. And the nasty. We have a religion for what late capitalism today. Mm -hmm. These folk have become deaf to the message of Christ. Whatever happened to the solemn blessings that opened the sermon? Mm -hmm. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are the, the, they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall sue God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can't be a Constantinian Christian and bear witness to this message. You can't be obsessed with walking the corridors of power. And I'm talking about Jesse. I'm talking about Al. You can't be obsessed with walking the corridors of and bear witness to this message. When Jesus read the scroll of Isaiah, he declared that we, if we hear him, must work for 
prophetically to transform this world. Yes. To release the captives and help the blind to see. To work for the liberation of all of those who are locked out, despised, and rejected. To unsettle the world. That is our charge. Right. Prophetic Christians must stand against the idolatry that masquerades as Christ's message. And it is a charge to keep our act, yes. as the old hymn would say. <laughs> Huh? A charge to keep my half of God to glory. A never dying soul to save infinite for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. After all, Jones exemplifies this prophetic fire. He turned his back on the ugliness of this world. I'm coming off for real. Y'all all right? Yeah. <laughs> Something told me to write this last night. <laughs> but Jones turned his back on the ugliness of this world, not by retreating into comfort, into the comfort of a false piety, but by working to make love present in a loveless world. Did you hear me? Yes. By challenging directly the evil that denies God's children their rightful place. He heard Jesus read the scroll. And he understood. Now what will you do in this moment? How will you bear witness to the life and ministry of Jesus in these times? These young folk are asking, <coughs> what side are you on? Yes. Right. And if you're asking, you're on Jesus' side, what does that mean? Yes. Jesus didn't wait for Powers to sanction his ministry. Jesus didn't wait to get a permit to preach the Lord of Jesus or to feed the hungry or to comfort the sick. Jesus didn't look to people in positions of power for salvation. He knew he was the Son of God. What will you do in this moment? Oh, you can pat yourselves on the back and celebrate that small job. But what are the details are you doing to ensure racial justice in this country, in this city of Chicago? As you witness all of this carnage and all of this death. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a convicted person. To be drunk with a new wine that makes you maladjusted to the status quo. To be charged to risk everything for our Lord and Savior. And in these times we need the followers of Jesus to step into the breach, yes. to hear his words and to risk everything to make this world a better place for our babies and the babies to come. We have to challenge the money changers. Yes. We have to respond with the power of love to all those around us who will spew hate. We need a revolution of values. And the idea that white people matter more than others is finally tossed in the trash bin of history. We need a radical Christian witness. We need a radical Christian witness. When these babies, and I close, when these babies are saying, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, they're not saying that they want you to understand that they matter. We know we matter. We know we matter. But we are sick and tired of you thinking that you matter more than us.